good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to have this opportunity to share with you guys what we've learned about tail regeneration in non-avian reptiles. So in today's presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce you to tail regeneration in lizards. And so we've been using this as a model system for tail regeneration for a number of years now, specifically the green anole, which is shown. But then I'll end the talk by mostly focusing on our newest study, which is really exciting to us um, and was published in November of 2020 and is the first to really characterize the anatomy of tail regeneration in a large animal such as the American alligator. So before we get into that, I'm sure as many of you know, mammals, which also include us humans, have a very limited capacity for regeneration. So although there are a number of tissues which are known to regrow, such as the liver, skeletal muscle, and skin, the majority of adult human tissues do not regenerate. And instead, when they're injured due to disease or trauma, this often leads to scar, uh, scar formation and fibrosis, which can impair the structure and the function. And so there's a very clear need for regenerative therapies in order to develop treatments or therapies that enhance wound healing and can help us look at better ways to improve the outcomes of traumatic injuries or degenerative or diseases related to age. And so just to give you an idea of what difference to regeneration versus repair is that most tissues in the adult are in homeostasis, they're fully specialized, but then when they become subject to injury, all animals are capable of activating this wound healing response. And the goal of the wound healing response is divided in, uh, the goal of the wound healing response is to basically restore structural integrity, but also to restore function. And so this wound healing response is divided into four overlapping phases, but the end product of this response, one is regeneration. And during this process in the diagram, you can see that there's no scar tissue, but the structure and function are also replaced and that it performs and looks very similar to that of the original tissue. However, us mammals undergo repair or fibrosis. And during this process, what happens is there's an accumulation of connective tissue, and this can lead to a disorganized matrix, which leads to structural abnormalities and those, as a result of this can lead to reduced or loss of function. And so this is commonly seen not only as the end point of normal wound healing, but this can also occur with disease pathology. So there's a clear need again to understand why mammals undergo repair and fibrosis and how we can enhance regenerative outcomes. So mammals do have some capacity of regeneration and the closest we'll ever get to growing, regrowing complex structures occurs during very early stages of development. So during neonatal stages, this is exemplified both in humans and in mice, we're able to regrow digit tips if the uh, very tip of the digit is amputated. Also during very early stages of regeneration during, or early stages of development, uh, during fetal stages, we also exhibit scarless healing if the skin or due to cutaneous wounds. But you can quickly see that as development proceeds, regenerative capacity is greatly reduced. And this is likely due to the fact that regeneration pathways are shut down, but it's important to remember that these pathways are not actually lost. So a lot of studies in animal systems are currently focused on understanding how we can reactivate these programs, but also integrate this with data from cellular processes and understanding the overall pro-regenerative environment. So luckily for us, there are a number of vertebrate models that we can use to study structural regeneration. So shown here on the left, I don't want you to worry too much about it, but these black lines are showing the relatedness of different animal groups. And those highlighted in red here are animals where regeneration has been previously reported, um, whether it be tissues, it can also be structures such as the tail or the lip. When we think about regeneration, we mostly study them in several common models. And I'm sure if you look here, you may be familiar with several of these. So our model of choice is the lizard. But um, other animals such as salamanders and frogs, which are both amphibians, are also capable of structural regeneration, as well as the zebrafish. 
So reptiles belong to a larger group of mammals called amniotes, and this also includes mammals. And so among this amniote group, you can see that tail regeneration has been reported in a number of different reptile groups, except for birds. But their close relationship um, as amniotes, that means they are the closest relatives to mammals that have a uh, regenerative capacity. And so their close relationship suggests that there's a greater commonality of genetic pathways. And if we can understand how to reactivate these pathways, understand why these pathways are so important, this may maximize our chances of clinical translation. So our lab has primarily focused on understanding tail regeneration in the green animal. And so among reptiles, this process is, most is mostly studied in lizards. So this includes the green animal, but it's also commonly studied in other species such as the common gecko or also the Italian wild lizard. So lizards have this natural ability to autotomize or self amputate their tails. And this process is facilitated by these planes of weakness, which we call autotomy planes, that are located within the vertebrae of the tail. So when an animal is grasped by its tail by a predator, it has the ability to readily detach and shed its tail. When this occurs, you can see that the detached tail has a very spontaneous movement. And so this temporarily distracts the predator and allows the individual to escape. And therefore the advantage is that it immediately maximizes the individual survival. So while this process is not necessary for regeneration, um, understanding why autotomy and regeneration occur is important as well. So tail loss can be costly to an individual. And so depending on the species, the tail has several important functions. One is that it's used for locomotive performance or balance, providing stability. And in the case of the alligator, we know that the tail is used as a propulsive force in its aquatic environment. The tail can also be used for predator evasion, as I had just described, defense, or may also act as a reservoir for fat uh, in a way to conserve its energy resources. It can also be used as a symbol for sexual selection, or, uh, or communicating its social status within a population. So why would we regenerate a tail? Given the tail has several important functions, the ability to restore some functionality by regrowing a tail alleviates the costs and consequences associated with a if a tail was completely lost. So um, in the green animal specifically, we've characterized three phases of tail regeneration. So the first phase is characterized as scar-free healing. And so this, during this process, there is no significant outgrowth. There is activation of a transient inflammatory response, which helps to remove any debris. We also see that during this stage, there's activation of cells that will contribute to the regenerating tail and that this process terminates with the formation of a thickened wound epidermis, which is thought to provide cues and signals to underlying cells for the regrowth process. This period is then followed by the regenerative phase. And so during this between 10 to 65 days, we see that there's outgrowth of the tail and elongation. And within the tail, you can see that new tissues begin to be reestablished. And so just to point out a few, here's cartilage, there's regrowth of skeletal muscle and regrowth of the spinal cord as well. So after 65 days, the tail looks very, uh, the tail looks very similar or the tail the regeneration looks almost complete. But we do know from previous studies that the tail does continue to mature. And so we've also looked at uh, repatterning of the peripheral nervous system, which is responsible for coordinating motor and sensory function. And so we see that there's a lot of remodeling during these late stages and that there is functional recovery of the regrown tail within a few months of tail loss. But what's really interesting about the regenerated tail in the lizard is that unlike other models of regeneration, the regenerated tail is not a perfect replica of the original tail.
So shown here on the left is an original tail section and shown here on the right is the regenerated tail section. And in this figure, we used an antibody to target a specific protein that allows us to identify nerves which are labeled in pink. So in both the original and regenerated tail, the spinal cord is situated at the center of the tail. But in the original tail, you can see that the spinal cord is not only composed of nerves, but it also includes cell bodies and myelin, which is a cell that helps support the nerves. In the regenerated tail, the spinal cord is much simpler in morphology. And so no new cell bodies or no new nerve cell bodies are produced in the regenerated tail. Instead, the regenerated spinal cord, which we call the ependema, mostly consists of regrowing nerves whose cell bodies are located in the original portion of the tail. But you can also see that there is regrowth of peripheral nerves, which again are involved in sensory and motor function, and that in the regrown tail, they are localized deep to the muscle, which are these uh, roots or these circular structures here. And so this uh, interac interaction between the nerves and the muscle are required for um, motor function as well. So if we look at this from another view, uh, so this is a histological stain, which allows us to look at the microanatomy of these structures um, and cellular structures. So again, at the very center of the original tail is the spinal cord and then the ependema and the regenerated tail. So in the original tail, the spinal cord is surrounded by bony vertebrae. And so these bony vertebrae are segmented along the uh, posterior to distal axis. And so here you can see the neural arch, and then this is the body of the vertebrae. In the regenerated tail, uh, the, uh, the structural support is maintained by this tube of cartilage. So this tube of cartilage you can see is radially symmetric and that it never goes on to ossify or form bone. And if you were to look at it along, again, the, post, the anterior to distal axis, uh, this structure is unsegmented. Last but not least, you can see that in the re regenerated tail, we can regrow, uh, lizards can regrow a large volume of muscle. However, the muscle structure and organization is slightly different from the original tail. So on the left here, you can see that the original tail is nicely divided into four distinct quadrants, and there's a clear asymmetry to it. But in the regenerated tail, this asymmetry is lost, and the skeletal muscle is radially organized around this central cartilage tube. So we've also been able to look at um, the cellular or the molecular pathways and genes that are activated during regeneration. And so this was done by a previous graduate student in our lab, uh, but this we are, we are able to use transcriptomics, which allows us to assess all the genes and pathways that are turned on during a specific time point of regeneration. So in this study, um, we looked at 25 days after regen after autotomy, and so this is the peak outgrowth phase when we see significant elongation of the regrown tail, and we see repatterning of different tissues. And this 25-day tail was then divided into five distinct segments. And so here in blue are genes that are turned on at very high levels in proximal regions of the tail, and then genes that are turned on at very high levels in the distal portion of the tail. And so to classify this, you can see that in proximal regions, there's a number of genes that are associated with muscle regeneration or muscle development. So in humans, we are able to regenerate our muscle, but if there is extensive damage to the muscle, uh, it, the muscle tissue undergoes fibrosis and repair instead. So these clues may give us some idea on how to maximize volumetric or severe cases of muscle injury or trauma. In the distal portion of the tail, there were a number of genes and pathways that were also associated with embryonic morphogenesis or developmental programs. Um, but there are also pathways related to the wound and immune response, which seems to be unique to the adult. But this wound and immune response is incredibly important for maintaining a environment that promotes scar-free healing 
and allowing the regenerative process to move forward after inflammation and clearance of any cellular debris. But while tear regeneration has been primarily studied in the green animal lizard, we were interested to see how tail regeneration, especially in terms of its anatomy, um, occurs in the American alligator, which is, belongs to a different group of reptiles, but is also much larger in size. So tail regeneration has been reported in many different types of crocodilian species. Um, and so alligators, as well as caimans and crocodiles, are all capable of tail regeneration. And to date, there are no reports of tail regeneration in gharials. But most of the studies that we have seen primarily look at tail regeneration or have reported tail regeneration in alligators and in caimans. So reports of tail regeneration date back all the way to 1937 um, with Kalin. And then 1960, Dave actually uh, examined a regenerated alligator tail and performed the first x-ray uh, and found that the regenerated tail or the regrown tail does not have any bone. And we'll get to that in a little bit more detail later. But you can see steadily from 2000 and even to last year, 2020, there have been a number of reports of tail regeneration in alligators. And so this can occur from full amputation or full or yeah, full amputation of the tail or even after partial injury. However, despite all of these reports, no one has really looked at uh, the internal anatomy of the regrown tail and uh, internal anatomy of the regrown tail. So this project started long before I had joined the lab in 2014. Um, we, had, we were working with our collaborator, Dr. Ruth Elsie. Um, who is a biological researcher at the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. And she sent us this photo um, of what we assumed was a regenerated tail. So we were always excited to know and look at whether uh, alligators were also capable of tail regeneration. So it wasn't until 2017 that Ruth reached back out to us and said that she had an alligator with a regenerated tail. And just to give you an idea of how large these tails are, the individual that this tail was obtained from was approximately four feet in length, and the regrown tail was about 9.5 inches in length. So we jumped at the chance to obtain this tail, which we had to have shipped to us in a gallon-sized pickle jar. In 2018, we received two more tails, uh, one from a female and one from a male. And all three of these tails were obtained from juvenile or sub-adult alligators. And in the two shown here, the regrown tail measured about 4.5 inches. So based on all of this, together we had three regenerated tails, um, but we had also acquired a uh, alligator that had an original tail intact. Now, because we were wanting to look at the structure and the anatomy of these tissues, we used a lot of imaging techniques such as x-rays and MRIs. We also performed gross dissection as a way to look at the uh, tissue the tissue composition, but we also used again histology to look at the microanatomy of these tissues at the cellular level as well. And so we had to get really creative about how we wanted to process these tails, especially when it came to histology Normally, we have instruments that are able to readily slice very small pieces of tissue, but um, it was clearly would not be the case with these alligators' tails, which are, uh, you know, anywhere with these regrown alligators with the longest we had being three quarters of a foot. Um, so this is just a photo of us dissecting and removing the scales, and you can see that the size of the alligator tail is about the size of my hands, uh, which are over here. But after we got these regrown alligator tails, we really wanted to characterize the internal anatomy. So the two questions we really set out to address was how does the alligator regenerated tail compare to the original tail? And does the regenerated alligator tail share the same anatomy as lizard regenerated tails? And answering this question would give us an idea of what regenerative processes or may hint at what processes are conserved within non-avian reptiles. 
So I want to brief start by introducing you to the original alligator tail segment. So for all three tails that we have observed, we also received a portion of the original tail, which is found upstream of the breakpoint. And so when you look at these tails, these are all three samples shown. We can see that the original tail segment is covered by these large scales, which are nicely organized into distinct rows, and that each row of scales is topped with these dorsal scoots. And if you look at the color, you can see that they're modeled in appearance, a combination of both black and gray, with darker coloration on top and lighter coloration on the bottom. To get a look at the internal anatomy, we used x-rays. And you can see that each, um, each single row of scales is associated with a caudal vertebrae. And these vertebrae feature these prominent processes which are used for attachment sites for muscle or tendons. But what we did notice is that the vertebrae closest to the breakpoint um, lacked these uh, processes, but also exhibited bone fissures which suggested to us that the tail may have been traumatically injured and that the bone had undergone a subsequent remodeling of the bone. So we were curious, when we got these tails, we had no idea when or how these tails were lost. We presume these tails were lost um, during uh, early stages of development, just because all of the individuals were young alligators. Um, but, we, but when we look at, when we took an x-ray of an original alligator tail, we can see that the vertebrae are distributed along the entire axis. And normally there's approximately 40 caudal vertebrae. You can see here on the very left that in the proximal regions, these vertebrae feature these transverse processes, but become much simpler in morphology as we go towards the distal end. But what we did notice is that none of these uh, vertebrae had autotomy planes or those planes of weakness that we uh, that I discussed earlier that are found in the lizard. And so that suggested to us that injury had occurred and this could be due to a traumatic boat accident or it could be uh, due to uh, predation by a larger alligator, um, especially since these individuals are juveniles. But what we did notice is that a single row of scales corresponds to a single vertebrae, and we were able to use morphological characteristics in order to determine exactly how much of the tail had been lost from these animals. So if we look here, you can see that up to segment 18, the row of scales are, are each have these paired dorsal scoots. And so this is a, a close-up view. So here's one and two of the pair. But then after caudal vertebrae 18, there's only a single pair of dorsal scoots. When we looked at the tails that we obtained, we noticed that A01, or the first sample we received, had these paired dorsal scoots, which suggested to us that injury must have occurred around caudal vertebrae 18 or before, suggesting that approximately half of the tail had been lost. And then when we looked at AO2 and AO3, they only had single dorsal scoots. But based on the uh, photographs we had, we were able to count the row of scales and determine that these two individuals had also lost approximately half of the tail um, around uh, segments 22 and 24. So overall, uh, these alligators sustained a uh, significant loss or truncation of the tail. Um, and so significant loss and truncation of the tail can obviously have um, consequences for uh, swimming or locomotive performance. So the majority of the original tail is enveloped by uh, skeletal muscle. And so here we were able to identify three distinct skeletal muscle groups. And here at the center is that vertebrae. And so if you look at the schematic diagram, uh, the muscle groups are divided into two sections. So you have a dorsal section and you have a ventral section. And so the smaller muscle, which is transversa spinalis, is used to stabilize the spinal column. And then longissimus and ilioischiocadalis are thought to coordinate flexion of the muscle, allowing the tail to move laterally. And so these two muscle groups 
are then separated by a horizontal septum or a thick band of connective tissue, and then a separated, and then a smaller band of connective tissue, which we call the dorsal septum. So just to confirm that this was indeed skeletal muscle, we used histology. So using uh, hematoxylin and eosin, which is just a stain uh, that allows us to analyze the structure, you can see that here uh, the skeletal muscle are organized into muscle fibers, and these muscle fibers are then organized into larger groups called fascicles. Uh, we also used a muscle-specific antibody uh, which is unique only to skeletal muscle, uh, to label these fibers. And so those that stain positively are here in brown. And we can see that most of these fibers are composed of fat, fast twitch type fibers, which is also consistent with what we see in lizard tail regeneration as well. But as I'm sure you guys are all more interested in is what exactly the regenerated alligator tail segment looks like. So for this single individual or uh, that is shown up here, the regrown tail was about 9.5 inches and this constituted up to about 18% of the animal's total body length. Um, and for the other samples, it constituted about six to 11% of the animal's total body length. But one thing you can see is that the regenerated tail is uh, easily distinguished by its external appearance. So you can see here that in AO1, AO2, and AO3, that the scales are, uh, are uniformly distributed, but they're also densely compacted into these small black scales. And so you don't see the mottled appearance that is normally apparent in the original tail, and we don't see these large scales, but we also see that they lack dorsal scoots. We were also able to obtain photographs from a collaborator which had also shown that regrowth is also possible um, following a partial injury to the dorsal surface. And you can see that the regrowth here also features these small densely compacted scales. So using the x-rays, we, uh, so here's the breakpoint as indicated by these bone, uh, the caudal vertebrae that exhibits the bone fissures. And by using these x-rays, we can see that there was no bone in the regenerated tail, we didn't see segmentation and we didn't see individual segments of vertebrae. But what we did notice was that there appeared to be this faint uh, uh, tube or rod-like structure that extended along the length of the tail. And again, that was also true when we looked at those that had partial, uh, partial injuries. So we looked at this in more depth by using magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and so magnetic resonance imaging revealed to us that this uh, tube-like structure is hollowed out in the middle and extends the entire length and is unsegmented. And that uh, along its entire length, there are channels or pores, which we think are used for um, uh, uh, blood vessels or peripheral nerves. And so we were able to 3D reconstruct this cartilage tube and you can see here, let me click over. You can see here that these pores are distributed along the entire length of the tail, of the regrown tail. But what we also notice is that this regrown tail, this cartilage or this, uh, this uh, regenerated endoskeleton was also ventrally positioned. And you can see that better here in these transverse sections. So we assumed that this tube-like structure was composed of cartilage, um, as that would have been consistent with what we knew about tail regeneration in uh, the green anna lizard. And we did go on to confirm this. So trichrome allows us to visualize um, different types of tissues, but it allows us to see any connective tissue in green. And so this morphology, or this is all connective tissue, which is consistent with cartilage, and within it are embedded chondrocytes or cartilage cells, which are recognized by these large cavities and then embedded with the cell nuclei here. We also did use a tissue specific antibody. So collagen 2A1 is an extracellular matrix component that is specific to cartilage. 
And again, we see that there is a positive staining along the border of the cartilage tube and the surrounding peripheral tissue. Um, but what was really surprising to us, especially when we started this dissection, was that the original tail has the most abundance of skeletal muscle. But when we cut into this, we found that the regrown tail actually had this very dense uh, white connective tissue that was very difficult for us to cut through. And, and it was strongly adhered to the overlapping scales. And so we wanted to characterize this in a bit more depth. And so just to show you a comparison again, so here on the left is what we expected if there had been muscle. But when we looked at the regrown tail and took a biopsy of this tissue, you can see that this forms a disorganized matrix which resembles a uh, connective tissue. And when we used a the muscle-specific antibody, we didn't observe any positive staining, which suggested to us that in the regrown tail, there is no regrowth of muscle. So we went on to characterize this a little bit further. And so these two stains allowed us to determine that this connective tissue was composed of collagen, both type 1 and type 3. And ratios of type 1 and type 3 collagen are also found in human scar tissue. So this suggested to us that there was some mechanism of wound repair also going on in the alligator tail. But embedded within this fibrous network was also abundance of regrown peripheral nerves, but also a number of blood vessels. So overall, we see that the regrown alligator tail exhibits features of regeneration, which was exemplified by the regrowth of skin, cartilage, peripheral nerves, and blood vessels. But we also see that exhibits features of wound repair, and that's primarily due to the lack of skeletal muscle and the abundance of scar-like connective tissue. And so we were curious to wonder why some tissues had regenerative capacity and why tissues such as skeletal muscle didn't in the alligator. So there are several hypotheses of what we expected. So the first one is that we think that regeneration might be limited by life stage or age. So as I mentioned before, all of the animals that we had obtained regrown tails from were young or juvenile alligators. So an example of reduced regeneration with age is also observed in the African clawed frog. So during very early stages of development, during the larval stage, uh, these frogs are able to regenerate their limb buds, they're able to regenerate their tails and the spinal cord, except for a small refractory period um, from stage 45 to around 46. But when these animals undergo metamorphosis and transition to the adult life phases, regenerative capacity is greatly reduced. And so this is exemplified by limb regeneration. So here you see an adult frog and an original limb. And so this limb is stained with alcyon blue and alizarin red. So the blue allows us to look at cartilage and alizarin red, which appears as purple here, allows us to uh, visualize bone. But you can see if this structure is amputated, uh, then there's regrowth, but the regrown structure is very different from that of the original. Instead, you get this spike-like structure and the, this structure is supported by this solid rod of cartilage. So the, um, so this structure and the solid rod of cartilage is very similar to what we had observed in the regrown alligator tail. And additionally, in the clawed frog, the regrown adult limb also lacks skeletal muscle and features the abundance of connective tissue, which again is consistent with what we had found in the alligator. So with that being said, it's actually unclear if adult alligators are capable of tail regeneration. So some of these photos provided from Ruth demonstrated that there are alligators that have tail truncated tails where no regrowth has occurred. And instead, the, the truncated tail ends as this wound stump and there's formation of scar tissue. But another second possibility that we expect, uh, that we hypothesize could contribute to the reduced regenerative capacity was that alligators are very large animals. So when you think about the models that we usually use to study regeneration, they're relatively small, both in size and in mass when you compare them to a human.
On the other hand, an alligator can grow up to 14 feet, which means that both its size and mass is relative, exceeds that of a human. But the reason why body size matters is because regeneration requires a lot of resources to be dedicated to regrowing these tissues. And so if all your energy is being dedicated to regrowth of tissues and lost structures, this could be costly and may limit developmental growth and reproduction. And so this is one reason why we think we don't see regrowth of skeletal muscle is because one, it's a highly metabolic tissue. And so um, a highly metabolic tissue, and so it may take up too much energy. So while there's no regrowth of muscle, we still think that regrowth of the tail provides some benefit that may be required uh, for stabilization or gives it a functional advantage still in its aquatic environment. So what I didn't mention before is that when we, alligators or this crocodilian lineage belongs to a larger group of reptiles, which we call archosaurs. And these archosaurs include the avian lineage, which are modern birds, as well as dinosaurs. And so they shared a last common, an their, uh, so they shared a common ancestor about 250 million years ago. And so as we were looking into the literature, we found that there was fossil evidence of tail regeneration in a Jurassic crocodile. And so this photo is an illustration of Steniosaurus valensis. And so the fossil evidence showed that if you look at the very distal portion of the of its tail, you can see that there are several caudal vertebrae, uh, but that there's also this caudal vertebrae, which seems to be attached to a solid rod of what we presume was cartilage. And so again, this is consistent with what we see in regeneration of both the American alligator and in the green animal lizard. So we were really curious to know whether there was any fossil evidence of tail regeneration in uh, non-avian dinosaurs, since we know that birds are not capable of regenerating complex structures. With Steniosaurus balensis, uh, so this in so uh, the Jurassic crocodile existed approximately 145 to 200 million years ago. So this was long after the two lineages had diverged. So we looked through the literature rather extensively, and to date we couldn't find any fossil evidence of dinosaur tail regeneration being reported. However, there are a number of reports that have found uh, dinosaur fossils with truncated tails. So one example is um, in, uh, uh, Massospondylus, where they found that approximately half of its tail had been truncated. And what caused them to believe this was that if they looked at caudal vertebrae 23 to 25, which is shown in more detail in these two panels here, is that these caudal vertebrae had fused, which suggested that at some point there was injury and there was remodeling of the bone. But again, there was no evidence of dinosaur tail regeneration. So this really raises the question of that of when exactly did regeneration or regenerative capacity get lost in the avian lineage and why would it have been maintained potentially in the crocodilian lineage? Um, but with that, I wanna leave you guys with the idea is that it's not just reptiles which are great models of vertebrate regeneration. And so as I mentioned before, a lot of people look at regeneration in the clawed frog, axolotl and zebrafish, um, and as you can see here from this graph is that regenerated structures vary both in structure, size, shape, um, and tissue composition. And so there's a lot that can be learned about what fundamental traits enable these animals to naturally regenerate. At the same time, we can also use cross comparative studies to identify uh, genes and pathways, as well as cues that are shared among all these animals, which may be great candidates for improving regenerative therapies in humans. And so if we think about this road to regeneration, right, each animal model offers different insights into the mechanisms that enable regeneration. And based on these studies, we can learn more about uh, the global gene networks and regulation that gets turned on throughout this process and also identify potential molecular cues that we could apply to promote growth of new tissues.
It also allows us to understand the cellular processes and how cells behave in response to injury and how different cells interact with one another. And lastly, it also gives us clues onto how uh, the environment is important. So how can we model an environment that is pro-regenerative and, um, and avoids the formation of scar tissue or uh, wound healing? And so all of this together combined with bioengineering someday could lead us to developing translational applications that overall would improve or enhance, um, enhance uh, regenerative therapies for humans. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you all, especially for coming to this talk, but also for all the collaborators at Arizona State University and the College of Medicine Phoenix from the University of Arizona, especially Ruth Elsie from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries for all their contributions to this project. Um, thank you to the Science Museum of Virginia for inviting me. Um, and if you guys do want to connect, you're welcome to reach out to me on Twitter. And at this time, I would be happy to take any questions that you guys may have. Um, so thanks. First clip with the cat messing with the detached lizard's tail. How long will they continue to move after they're detached? Yeah, so it's variable, but most of the time it maybe lasts a minute, maybe two minutes. But that's always enough time for the lizards to kind of escape and run away. Uh, so how many times can a lizard lose and then regrow the tail? Is that a one-time thing or can it happen multiple? So that's a great question. So lizards can lose their tails multiple times, but each time they lose the tail, the regrown tail is not only different in anatomy, but you may have noticed that the regrown tail is also much shorter. And so there is a point where if you keep removing the tail, you'll run out of those autotomy planes in the vertebrae. And so at some point, right, it may be if there's persistent damage or if you continue to do so, uh, this process may end in scar formation and fibrosis. When the alligators regrow their tails and it's, it's not skeletal muscle, how does that affect the mobility of the regrown portion of the tail? Yeah. So without skeletal muscle, um, that clearly means that, right, you have no contraction of muscle. So flexion is clearly disrupted in these alligator tails. And that even though we do see regrowth of the peripheral nerves, we assume that those nerves are primarily involved with, um, with, uh, with a sensory function and not necessarily motor function. But we do think that the regrowth of the tail may offer some benefit. Um, even if it can't be flexed, it may provide um, stability or it may maximize surface area that allows them to still navigate the aquatic environment. So much of the propulsive force is probably still being generated by the original tail, but um, we're not exactly sure how the regrown portion can contribute to the functional uh, restoration. Can all lizards regrow, regenerate their tails like a, a gila monster, for example? Could it regrow its tail? No, so that's a good question. So not all lizards can regrow their tail. So it is highly variable between species. Um, but I think it's really important to not just focus right on the two or three common lizard systems that we have, uh, because there's a lot of diversity. They all have different fundamental life traits. And so if we can understand why one species can regenerate and why another species can, we may be able to start to uncovering, you know, processes or traits that uh, limit regeneration and see what we can learn and apply that to, um, you know, the development of medical therapies and how to work around those traits. All right, and we did have the question, are you currently still at ASU? No, I'm not. So I am now uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital. And so as much as I loved working with lizards and uh, doing the study in uh, alligators, I'm now working at Massachusetts General Hospital where I'm looking at uh, how we can use different strategies to promote tendon tissue repair and tendon regeneration.
Okay, so it looks like that's all we've got. So we'll go ahead and bring it to a close for today. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cindy Shu, for joining us and helping us discover more about our world. Please join us next week on Wednesday, February 10th at noon. Uh, we will have live from the UK, uh, Malone McQuende, who is a third year medical student in the UK. And he will be presenting on uh, a project that he founded called Mind the Gap. And they produced a clinical handbook uh, for clinical signs of medical conditions on people with black and brown skin. Uh, so this is something that was very badly needed in medical education. Uh, and Mr. McQuende was a founder of a project to help kind of remedy that. Uh, so definitely please do join us next week, Wednesday, February 10th at noon for that. Uh, you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thanks very much.